All right, now I'm going to want you to keep your, your place here in Haggai, and we're going to go backwards to the book of Ezra. As this is a, a very short book I mentioned earlier, But in order to get the context of Haggai, we're going to have to look at the book of Ezra. And we're going to go to Ezra chapter 4. Because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of books in the Old Testament, especially with the minor prophets, where there were, there were people, were, there were preachers preaching all like in the same time frame, and same time period. And um, what the time period where this is taking place, so it says in, in verse 1 of Haggai chapter 1, in the second year of Darius the king. Darius was the Persian king, the king of the Persian Empire. So you remember when the children of Israel, they were taken captive by the Babylonian Empire, right? Nebuchadnezzar came in and, and took all the children of Israel captive, brought them back to Babylon. And that's like around the time of Daniel, right? Remember Daniel was... was um, Around, he, he went and spoke to King Nebuchadnezzar and when he had those dreams and everything else. So just to get an idea, these are good things to keep in mind the more you read your Bible, all the different prophecies and all the different preaching and teaching that's going on and what time it all fits into. The book of Haggai, this, this prophet Haggai, is preaching during the time of, this is Darius, is the, the Persian king. He came after Nebuchadnezzar. A few kings later, there's Cyrus and then there was... I don't know the exact order of it. Um, we have Artaxerxes and Ahasuerus were in there and Darius. And these were kings that were reigning over the Persian Empire. And this is after, though, um, we're going to see a little bit in Ezra, a little bit of a better, more concise time frame here. But basically, Cyrus was the king of Persia, and he's the one where the Lord put it into his heart to allow the children of Israel to go back and rebuild the temple. So after they had been in captivity for a while, God puts it into the heart of Cyrus the king to allow the Jews to go back, rebuild the temple, and, and God's going to bless them again, allow them to rebuild. They had been um, enslaved long enough. They had been taken captive for, for a long enough period of time. So this is a, a time when, when Haggai now is preaching to the people after the work had already begun to rebuild that temple. So just keep that in mind. Let's go back to Ezra chapter 4. Keep your place here in Haggai. We're going to come right back to it. But it's important to get the full context of why he's preaching this to these people and what's going on. Ezra chapter 4 verse number 3 says, But Zerubbabel and Jeshua, remember these are the same exact people you'll see in Haggai chapter 1. It's the same people that, that are the, the priest and the, and the governor. It says, And the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of, God of Israel, as King Cyrus the king of Persia hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. This is the same Darius that we're talking about here in Haggai chapter 1. So basically what's happening is there's these people, and if you read the whole book of Ezra and Nehemiah, there are people that want to frustrate the cause of the rebuilding of the temple. There's people that hate the Jews, and they hated their God, and they hated everything about them. They wanted, they wanted their work to fail. They wanted their work to cease. They didn't want them going back and rebuilding the temple and, and, and being established again as a nation and as a people. So the very first tactic that they use is say, hey, <coughs> we want to help. They say, hey, we want to come and help and be a part of this. And that's where we started reading. I didn't read verses 1 and 2, but that's basically what happened. Verse 3 shows, they deny him. They're like, you have nothing to do with our God. We're going to go and do this work. And they said, we're going to do you know, as the king of Cyrus has commanded us to do. Because he's the one that made the proclamation that they're going to go back and rebuild the temple. So... It says here, then the people of the land, in verse 4, they weakened the hands of the people of Judah. They're trying to get that cause not to work. They're doing whatever they can to, to frustrate the building. It says, and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them. 
So people that's going to give advice on how to do things, whatever, the counselors were hired against them to, to make it harder for them to build. It says to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia. So Cyrus is the one who commanded it. That's when they started doing the work, started you know, building and digging and laying the foundation. It says, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, which is a long time. Now, I don't know the exact amount of years, but it's a significant amount of time because there are multiple kings that have reigned over that time period. Now, it's not too long for these people to not still be alive. But I mean, we're talking at least 40, 50 years have, have, have gone by in this whole time frame that we're talking about here. It's not just a real short thing. It says in verse 6, And then, and in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes, wrote Bishlam and Mithridath, Tabiel and the rest of their companions unto Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the writing of letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. And then it goes on what they're saying. They make all these accusations saying that, you know, these are a people who in time past have been this rebellious people and they're not going to pay their taxes. And, you know, and they've had some great mighty kings because this is after, you know, all of the events of, of the house of David, you know, and the kingdom and everything else. This is after all that. So they're saying, look at the history. You know, these people have had some mighty kings. They've been a real pro problem. You don't want them going back and building up their temple and rebuilding Jerusalem. Don't let this happen. So they, they write this to Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes is a king that's, that's somewhere in between the time frame of Cyrus and Darius. Because Cyrus is the one that said, do it. And then Darius ultimately is going to, we're going to see, he's going to be the one that says, again, that endorses them doing this. But in between, there's, there's kings and that, they're, that the people who are against them are trying to get favor with and say, hey, don't let them do this. So let's jump down in Ezra 4 to verse number 23. The Bible reads, Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem under the Jews and made them to cease by force and power. So basically, Artaxerxes says, yeah, you guys are right. You know, I don't think we should let them build this temple. And he basically writes a decree saying that I don't want you to do this work. And so these people are jumping on it, right? I mean, this is, it, these people hated them. They wanted them to stop. So as soon as they get that letter, they're jumping down there and make them cease. It says by force and by power. So they're just forcing them to stop. You know, they're just saying like, you're not doing this. And they come in forcefully. And it says in verse 24, then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Second year of Darius, king of Persia, that's exactly where we are picking up here in Haggai chapter 1. Now, keep your place in Ezra. We're going to go back there. I think I, got one, I think I have one more reference in Ezra for you. If you want to keep a, a bookmark there, we're going to be getting to it later in the sermon. But um, you might want to just, just save your place there so you don't have to find it again when you flip back. But just so we understand the context, now Haggai is preaching to the children of Israel during this time frame. It's right before they're going to start working again because they had been stopped. Their work had been stopped. They had started laying the foundation. They started doing this work. And then all of a sudden, the people that hate them, you know, they, they were making it real difficult for them. They make it hard on them until it got to the point to where they just completely stopped what they're doing. And there was a long gap from when the foundation was first laid during the reign of Cyrus and when they started working again under Darius. Haggai chapter 2, or I mean chapter 1, verse number 2. The Bible says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So here's, we see the general attitude of the people. They're saying, Well, it's not quite time yet. And this is a bad attitude to have, and this is one of the reasons why Haggai was sent to preach to these people. Because what happened is they faced a lot of problems. They faced a lot of opposition. They faced people who were trying to get them to stop the great work that they were doing in the name of the Lord. And the people now, because they faced that opposition, are saying, well, it must not be God's time. And they say, well, if God wanted it to happen, you know, he'd, he'd make this happen, but we're just not going to do anything now because it's just, it's just not the right time. It's just not time for us to do that. So many people, even today, and we're going to go through some applications of this into our own personal lives as we look at the events that happened during this. So many people wait on doing anything for God because they think that, well, right now is not that good of a time. 
I'm not ready to serve God right now. It's, it's just not the right time. It's not, a good t- it's not the right time in my life. It's not a good time. I've got all these other things I've got to do. I'll serve God later on. They put God, serving God on the back burner. Or they'll, they'll look at their circumstances and say, well, there's no way I could serve God because I've got to do this or that. Wrong attitude. Wrong way to think. It's always time to serve God. And especially when God has a plan for you. Because God had a plan for them. God's the one who worked it in the heart of Cyrus for them to even get the commandment to go and rebuild the temple in the first place. That is of God. It is God's will that his house be built. So we can't look at the events of Satan and the opposition and them fighting against you and say, well, it must not be of God because otherwise why are all these people fighting against me? It's actually just the opposite. If you're doing the right thing, you can expect to get the opposition against you. Don't use that to moment. You say, well, it's just not the right time. It must not be God's time for this to happen. Now, you could, you could kind of understand what they're talking about because think about this. You know, in your life, I know in my life, I haven't gotten to the point of trying to serve God where people are physically trying to stop me and restrain me from doing it. And where the order has come down from the king of the whole realm saying, you can't do this, and people going and physically enforcing it. I haven't gotten to that level of opposition yet. So you could see where they're coming from. But the lesson that we're learning from the Bible is that even in the face of such opposition, it's not the right time to say, well, it's, it's not the right time for this. It was, it was wrong for the children of Israel to think that they shouldn't do the work and they shouldn't continue moving forward, even when things got that bad. Let's keep that in mind. See, many people, here's a good example that, that might be a little bit more relevant to, what, to, to, to your situation today. I know a lot of people hold off on giving the gospel to somebody in their life because they, they're waiting for that right, perfect moment to preach them the gospel. And say, until that moment comes, you know, I don't want to bring it up because I want them getting mad. I want you to look. That is a bad way to think. Now, praise God when these great opportunities do arise. Praise the Lord for that. That is great. It's awesome. I love it when those opportunities arise, when, when you have this perfect scenario everything, the whole conversation, everything works out just great. That's awesome. But you can't just sit around and wait for those events to happen. You need to be proactive in your pursuit of giving people the gospel. I love what it says in Romans chapter 10, at the end of the chapter in verse number 20. The Bible says, But Isaiah, talking about Isaiah, is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. So he says, Isaiah's bold. Why is he bold? Because he went and talked to the people that weren't even seeking for him. You know, that's what we do when we go out soul winning. And it takes boldness to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because these people aren't coming to our church and asking us how to be saved and, and everything's just lining up perfectly. We're bringing it to them. We're doing the work and going out and bringing them the gospel. They're not seeking us out. He's saying, I, I've found of them that sought me not. They weren't seeking me, but guess what? I found them. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. They're not asking for salvation, but we're going to bring it to them anyways. And this is the type of, of attitude that we need to have in general when it comes to soul winning. Don't just wait and sit back and say, well, it's not the right time. No, it's not the right time to give the gospel to my mother. It's not the right time to give the gospel to my father. It's just not the right time. I've got to wait till something else happens. So, you know, look, it's always the right time. We can't just sit back and make that decision. You never know what's going on in a person's life to say, oh, it's not the right time. Anyways. You don't always know that. I've talked to people sometimes and it's amazing the way God will work out for you to cross paths with someone and what is going on in their life and what they've been thinking about when you actually just, just pursue it and, and the conversation has nothing to do with the gospel but you just decide, you know what, I'm going to bring it up anyways. I'm going to give them the gospel anyways because I have a chance right now. They're sitting right here. It may not be the perfect opportunity. They may get upset at me. Maybe I've tried giving it to them in the past and they just get upset with you. You don't know at any given time when is the right time exactly. It's always the right time to give the gospel. So let's look at how he responds in Haggai. Because he was saying, look, the people say in verse 2, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. It's not time to build, to build the temple. 
Verse 3, then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? So now he's saying, okay. Verse 5, now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He's saying, you, you've got your houses all, all made up. You've got your house nice and built and prepared. And you've got a nice place to go to every night. And it's okay for the house of God just to lie in ruins? You've got all your stuff in row at home, but you think it's fine to just do it and say, oh yeah, it's still not time to build, to build the house of God. He says, consider your ways. Think about it. Think about your ways. Think about what you're saying. You're saying, yeah, I've got time to spend at my house and doing all this other stuff that doesn't matter for God, but and yeah, it's not, it's not quite time to build the house of God yet. It's not quite time to put any effort for, for church or for God or for doing the work that he has laid out for me. I still need to get more things in order at home. And I love what he's saying here because we know, we know that they face a lot of opposition and we know that the opposition was serious. Does he mention anything at all about that opposition in this chapter? No, he does not. Not once. What does he say? He says, consider your ways. He didn't say consider the ways of the people that are opposing you and threatening you and, and physically trying to stop you. He says, consider your ways. Your ways aren't right. Doesn't even bring it up. That's why we had to go back to Ezra, just so you could understand that context. Now, that context is very important to understand when we hear this message that Haggai is bringing to him. Because even in that phase, you could say, well, God's going to understand. I mean, look at, their, look at the way they're opposing him. It's against the law. Consider your ways. Is it right? See, I know what the law says, but is it right that the house of God lies waste? Is it right? Consider your ways. Let's keep reading here. Verse number six. He says, You have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. I read all this, this whole verse 6, and all I think about is a hamster wheel. Right? Because that's basically what they're doing. He's saying, look, you're doing all of this work, and you're getting almost nothing back. You're, you're earning money. You're making all this money, and you're putting it in your bag, and your bag like got a big hole in the bottom. It just completely goes out, and it just washes away, and you've got nothing left. And you're, you're doing all this work because you're focusing on the wrong things. And this is the judgment of God that's coming upon him. And he's pointing this out to them, saying, look, you're sowing in the fields, and you're putting all this work in out there, and how much are you getting back? You're, you're, you're doing all this work, and you're earning all these wages, and you're making all these clothing. Clothing's not keeping you warm. You're not being fed well. You're not, you know, you're not making money. Don't, you guys got to think about these things. Consider your ways. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. He repeats himself again. Look, consider your ways. Verse 8, Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, look what he says here, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. He lets them know without a doubt. He's saying, you know, you've been doing all this stuff and it hasn't been prospering. God hasn't been blessing you. Why? Because you're focused on the wrong thing. Because you're not seeking out the kingdom of God first. Because you're not in, in, worried about God's house and building the house of the Lord. You're more worried about building your own house and getting take, that taken care of first. That's why none of your stuff is being blessed. That's why God's not, not blessing the work of your hands and, and everything else that you do. It's on purpose. It's because God's trying to get your attention. And as children of God, listen to me, as, as a child of God, expect this to happen to you. If you are God's child today and you decide to do everything else with your life but to serve God, God's going to take your work and He's going to blow upon it. He's going to say, oh, okay. You want to invest your life into being a big famous star or, you know, this, this big uh, CEO corporate mogul or, or whatever. You want, you want to invest all of your time into that? God's saying, guess what? You're not going to get that. You're not going to, you're not going to get what you're trying to achieve because that's not what I want you to do. 
I want you to be able to invest your time into making sure the house of God is prosperous, that you are working on things that, that God has laid out for you to do and not just what you want to do with your own house and everything else. You want to invest all of your time in everything else but to serve the Lord. God will make sure that those things do not come to prosper. It's going to get you nowhere. That's why the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Talking about the basic necessities, because God knows we have necessities. But when you dedicate your entire life to doing all these other things, you're not just worried about the necessities. I'm sorry. It does not take you your entire, all of the time that you have just to meet your own necessities of feeding yourself and feeding your family. It may take a lot of work, but it doesn't take all your time. It shouldn't take all of your time. We need to be able to... to, to appropriate the time that we have righteously and in a way that God will be pleased with. He says here, let's keep reading in verse number 10. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from her fruit. God's not blessing the crops that they're growing. He said that's why the dew's not coming down. That's why the earth isn't just bringing forth fruit abundantly. And you remember when, when the children of Israel do and what's right, he says, hey, I'm going to bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey, you're going to be blessed. The fruit's going to, you know, the, the ground is going to produce its fruit. I will bless you tremendously when you obey God, when you follow His will. But when you don't, you're not going to be blessed with that. Verse 11, And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. God is capable of of doing anything. God is capable of making sure that, that you are going to spin your wheels like the little hamster in the hamster wheel, that you, you're putting forth a lot of effort and you're trying to run and get as fast, as fast as you can and you're going nowhere. And when you get, put, a, put God in the back seat and say, well, I'm going to do this, that you're going to be spinning your wheels. You're going to get nowhere. You, instead of just trusting God and saying, well, this is what God wants me to do, so I'm going to do that first. I'm going to make sure that that gets taken care of Hey, God could bless you in the other ways of, of the other things that you want to accomplish, things you want to accomplish with your life other than serving God. He could help you out with that. But if you decide just to say, no, I'm going to put this first, don't expect God to help you. Actually, you can expect God to be against you. Verse number 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people did fear before the Lord. And here we see just another example of the importance, as I would say, of coming to church or the importance of hearing a man of God preaching the word of the Lord. Because here you see, look, what did they do? They obeyed, they listened to the Lord their God. They listened to God's word and the words of Haggai the prophet. They listened to the prophet. They listened to what he had to say. And look, they wouldn't have been listening to God even though they knew what he wanted. They knew the will of the Lord was for the temple to be built. They knew that, that God, well, they just thought, well, it's not really God's time. It's not time for that. But we know that, that why wouldn't God want the temple to be rebuilt? Of course he wants the temple to be rebuilt. But it took the, the preaching of Haggai, the prophet, and other preachers at that time. You have Ezra, you have Nehemiah, you have other people that were also trying to, to push and do good things for the Lord. It needed that in order for the people to come to their senses and say, oh yeah, we need to do this. And this is one of the things that you get at a good church that preaches the word of the Lord. And this is why it's so important to come, not just the Sunday morning service, but the Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, whenever their service is to come in and hear the word of God so that you can be getting the zeal that you need. You can get the proper edification and the comfort and the, the motivation to go out and do God's will and to get your focus back right and say, yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting distracted with all these other cares of the world. And I need to get back into what God has for me to do. And the people listened to this. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. As the Lord their God had sent him. God sends preachers in order for people to listen to, to, to get the change done that he wants to have done, to get people to do the work that he has laid out for them. It says, and the people did fear before the Lord. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 13. The Bible says, Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, 
I am with you, saith the Lord. And this is, this is you know, what the, the preachers need to be doing. If you're going to be the Lord's messenger, then you better be preaching the Lord's message and don't be adding in your own words and adding in your own message instead of preaching just what God had sent you to do. And what God has sent the preachers to do is to preach the whole counsel of God. Preach all of His words. Don't pick and choose. Don't hold back. Preach all of it. God wants us all to grow. Every word of God is pure. Every, every, um, every prophecy of God is profitable for doctrine and for instruction. Everything. Every, every aspect of the Bible we need to know and we need to learn and grow by. And His message here, He's saying, look, God wants them encouraged. God wants them doing work. He says, I'm with you. I know that you have this opposition. I know that, that it's against the law. I know that people are physically going to try to stop you, but I am with you. And look, if God be for us, who can be against us? Keep that in mind as the oppositions mount in your life against trying to do what's right. No matter what is happening, if God is with you, nobody can be against you. Verse 14, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jozadek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Hearing the good preaching, hearing Haggai the prophet and the other prophets coming and preaching and telling, look, consider your ways. And that's not always the most positive message. Look, consider your ways. Look at what's happening. Look at what's going on around you. God's not blessing you. Look, you need to get to work. Not everyone wants to hear that message, but it's the truth. And he's saying, you need to do this. Consider what you're doing. He said twice, consider your ways. That's the rebuke that was needed, but they heard the rebuke, and what happened? God stirred up their spirits. They heard the preaching, they accepted, they received the word of the Lord, and God stirred them up and said, all right, let's get going now. They've humbled themselves. They recognize, yeah, you know what? You're right. We need to do what's right here. We need to work for God. And God stirred them up and motivated them and sent them out and they got started on this great work. It says they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. We need more people that are interested in doing work for God instead of coming to church and asking the church, what can you do for me? I've got all these problems. I want you to help me. Hey, what kind of work are you going to do for God? Now look, the church is here to help. Absolutely. We want people to get sin out of their life. We want to get you, help you get on your feet, help you get serving God and everything else. But hopefully your motivation is going to be thinking, look, I want to be the best servant to the Lord that I can possibly be. I want, I want to do what He has for me to do. So what kind of work can I do for God? I want, I want to help this church to grow. I want to help the house of God to get bigger and that more souls will get saved and baptized and taught and, and continue to do the work that we're doing and we could grow in great numbers. Flip back, if you would, to Ezra. We're almost on a little bit of a shorter sermon tonight. Ezra chapter number 5. We were in Ezra 4 earlier. Ezra chapter 5. So we see here the, the souls of the people, they're stirred up. They heard the preaching. They're going to get to work. There's something important here that, I, that, that isn't quite mentioned specifically in Haggai. Ezra chapter 5, verse number 1. The Bible says, Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. So you see, you know, Zechariah is another book of the Bible which also takes place during this same time. You've got Haggai preaching to him. You've got Zechariah. You also have the work of Ezra and Nehemiah going on. All these books are happening concurrently. They're happening at the same time during the same events that are going on. Verse 2, Then rose up Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Jozadak and began to build the house of God which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. So here we see that it wasn't just the governor. It wasn't just the high priest. It wasn't even just the Jews, but the prophets. So when you have Haggai and Zechariah coming and preaching and saying, Look, consider your ways. You've got to get to work. We've got to build this temple. They didn't just say it from the pulpit and say, okay, you guys get to work. It says the prophets of God helping them. 
They got right in there. And that's the way, you know, a good church, you ought to be able to judge the church by the fruits and by the works of the church. Right? That's one of the ways you can know a good church. And hopefully you're going to a church. Well, I know you are here, but um, if you're ever looking to go to another church, look at churches where the pastors are getting out and doing the work also. Where they're getting their hands dirty. Hey, no, I'm not just going to sit here and tell you to go out and win souls. I'm going to go with you and we'll go out and win souls. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, hey, you need to memorize the Bible. I'm going to be memorizing the Bible with you. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you need to be coming to church and, you know, three to every time we have a service and me not coming to church every time there's a service. I'm not going to ask you to do anything I'm not willing to do myself. Why? Because I wholeheartedly believe that this is all for all of us. God's word applies to everybody equally. It's not just for you. It's also for me. It's for everybody. And so when I preach on sin real hard, hey, look, I better not have any of these sins in my house. Yeah, I'm not going to be a hypocrite preaching this to you. I'm going to make sure I get this stuff right. And the things that I believe to be true and the things that I preach to you are going to be the things that I am going to do also. And that's what the man of God is supposed to do. And that's what we see here in Haggai and in Zechariah, that they got their hands dirty too. And they went right in and they said, yes, we're going to build this house of God. We'll be there right with you. Because really the preachers are supposed to be a good leader. And the, way, the best way to lead is by example. You know, they used to have uh, troops and armies, the, the generals. They'd be the first ones in the battle. They were leading the charge. Now it's like, Cowardice. Now it's like, oh, no, no, we need to stay all the way back here and we're going to send all of your children to go into war. And all the politicians, they're the ones saying, okay, we're going to have this war with another country and you guys are all going to go and do the fighting. We're going to make the decisions, you go do the fighting. That's not right. You can't, you can't have respect for someone who's going to say, who's going to make a decision like that and say, you, know, you go all risk your lives while we sit back here. No, a good leader, a, a proper leader, and this is the way things used to be when people had integrity, when men were men and, and, and uh, you know, things were, were done a little bit differently. The, the person in charge was going to lead the battle. I mean, you see the kings of Israel, the kings were always going out into battle. I mean, David was going out into battle until he physically couldn't even really do it anymore when he almost died in battle just because he wasn't strong enough to fight physically. You know, the people finally said, okay, look, David, you know, let's hang back a little bit, <laughs> hang back here. We don't want to lose you as the king because, he, you know, he had, he had reigned for so long, he got into an age where he wasn't able to, to do it anymore. But he was always fighting in those battles. And when he didn't, he got into sin. Remember that with Bathsheba. There's a time when kings go out to wars when he was walking around on his rooftop instead of going out to the battle with Joab. Joab's the one that had to call him back and said, hey, we're about to take this city. You know, you're going to get the glory and honor just so that they don't give me all the glory and honor. Why don't you get your butt down here? And that was during that time when he committed all that sin. Because as a leader, his job, he should have been out and doing that work. And the preacher, the, pre the pastor, is not, not getting out and doing the work and knocking the doors and doing all the things that he's preaching and his right to do. I bet you they're going to get themselves into sin because they're not keeping themselves busy with the things they need to be busy with. You still in Ezra? Flip over to chapter 6 real quick. It's one last verse we'll look at. Ezra chapter 6, verse number 14. The Bible says, And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, and they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So we see even the elders of the Jews were building. These were the people that, that held the, the, the positions of authority and power, the elders. Um, that's why we saw the Joshua and um, what was the other guy's name? Zerubbabel, they were both out there. They were leaders. They were, you know, the governor and the high priest, and they were, they were out there working. And it says that they prospered 
The work that they did prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Video. So the things that they did, they did even better because they were getting the good preaching. They were hearing from the word of God. It was motivating them and stirring them up. Again, another reason why it's so important to come to church to get that motivation. So they built it. And fit. And the, now, there's a lot of time that went through here. But they were able to finish the work that was laid out before them just by, because, by getting right with God. And we don't read anymore. Now, there is, there's still continued to receive threats, but um, they got in, from Darius, they got like, permission again, basically, to go and do this work. Because what, what happened is, just to give you the rest of the backstory, if you don't know it already, is, um, you know, Artaxerxes was saying, um, don't, you know, he, he was persuaded to have them not build. But then they went back and they said, look, you know, we're just doing what Cyrus told, or what Cyrus originally told us to do. They're like, search it out, go find out. And then, and, and Darius did that. He went back and saw, oh look, Cyrus did tell them that he wanted this built, and which was just one of the kings of Persia. He said, okay, well if he wanted this done, you know, this is the Lord. Let's let's get this done. And then uh, Darius endorsed what they were doing. But see, they needed the mind to work. God blessed their, their desire then to get out there and start doing the work by allowing that to happen with Darius. But they needed to, to, to put that in the forefront and make that important. They could have said that a long time ago, back when, back when the, the decree came from Artaxerxes, instead of just saying, oh, okay, well, we'll stop then. Why didn't they keep pushing and fighting and saying, no, look, we're doing what, what Cyrus told us to do. You know, king, why don't you go and look this up? We already got authorization from this. We already got the, the, the authorization and to, to get all of our artifacts back and all the, the, the bowls and the basins and everything that we used to worship the Lord. That was already given to us to go back and to rebuild this temple. And they could have fought that fight, but instead they gave up. They gave up and said, well, it's just not time for that. <clears throat> we should never give up. No matter what you face, don't give up the work that God has for you, but um, do what he has by faith, knowing that he'll bless the work that he's laid out for you to do. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great chapter, dear God. I love this book, the, this short book of the Bible, Haggai, and the great preaching that we see here, and the motivation for the people to build and to work and to do the work that you have laid out for them, dear God. I pray that you please help us to always keep this in remembrance as your children, that, that you want us doing work for you, doing work for our Heavenly Father, dear God. Help us never to forget this so that we don't um, end up bringing just our own hard times upon ourselves because you're not blessing us because we're not putting you first, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us all to be mindful of this and we pray that you would bless the work that we're doing here. Lord, I know that, that everyone here today is very interested in doing your work and has, has already proved themselves to be hard workers, dear God. And I pray that you would please bless the, the efforts that we are making to serve you and that you would build us a great house here, dear Lord, that would bring honor and glory unto your name and that would help us to see many souls get saved. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.